I hope you'll forgive me if two years ago you were here and you heard some of what I'm about to tell you. Sorry. <coughs> In celebrating our church's 300th anniversary, we're not just celebrating the survival of an old building. We're celebrating <coughs> and honoring our church family down through the years. Those many hundreds of women, men, and children who came here seeking God's help to sustain and fortify them for the uncertainties of life. But until now, a significant group of our church family has been missing, overlooked, deleted from our collective memory and history. But almost from the beginning, that missing group, Africans and so-called mulattoes, that group was an essential part of the founding and building up of what comprised early Kittery, an area that once extended from here on up through Elliott and the Berwicks, south, middle, and north. If we were to step back in time, we would see their darker skinned faces among the white British settlers as everyone worked together to clear the forested wilderness, build log huts, dig out huge stumps to create farmland, build miles of stone walls between property, and as Puritan controlled government required, also build those first small rough timbered meeting houses, one at Frank's Fort, Upper Elliot, and the other here at Kittery Point, somewhere around the year 1650. Of course, though the Africans, or blacks, labored shoulder to shoulder with the British, the reward for their labor was radically different. Blacks would gain no profit from their efforts. They would not begin to build up wealth as the British settlers were beginning to do. Though blacks' presence and labor would significantly aid that wealth buildup over the years, no part of it would ever be theirs. They were the slaves, human property to be bought and sold. Designated as servants for life, a euphemism printed on slave owners' property tax forms, the blacks and their loved ones endured a life of hopelessness and terrible uncertainty as to their future. There is so much misinformation in local history um, so much error concerning slavery in early Kittery. Contrary to what's written, there were not just a few slaves, and there were not just a few slave owners. Nor, evidently, was slavery or slave ownership only among the wealthy. In my research over the last three years, um, which involved all parts of the old parish, I've located uh, a little over 300 enslaved blacks and 100 or so others who were likely or might have been enslaved during that era of he the inhuman institution in Massachusetts and its province of Maine. Furthermore, there are good reasons to believe those numbers would be much increased if all who never made it into the records could be accounted for. Two major, major reasons. 18th century census records only accounted for blacks over the age of 16 and under 45. And tax regulations had a similar age bracket, which limited how many of a slave owner's human property qualified for assessment. We can only speculate on how many enslaved children and older workers are missing from the count. As a side note, as, you, as I go along, you'll notice an awful lot of qualifiers that sort of jam up the works and slow down the telling. But if it weren't for words such as likely and probably and possibly and might have been and other such, one could not sensibly talk about black history in this region. It's not like white history. Records of it are so scattered and brief and so often there is much uncertainty in interpreting the content of such records. Discussing or writing about this topic can be a quagmire for potential error. 
But nonetheless, there is much that can be said with some measure of certainty about the life of black persons who came to Old Kittery's various meeting houses over the years, who sat in segregated, excuse me, who sat in segregated spaces, a back bench or up in a gallery. In this church's gallery, circa 1750, one would have seen numerous families up along that gallery and in two galleries which extended down on either side. I think it's rather haunting this morning to hear that indeed those blacks, those uh, top sashes would have dropped down because people were in the balcony and sweltering in the summer heat. <coughs> Excuse me. As to personal appearance of the blacks, their skin coloring and hair quality were likely the only attributes which set them apart from everyone else. Blacks' manner of dress, of social habits, speech, and levels of skills would have been much like those of the general non-wealthy white population. And by the mid-century, many, if not most, of the enslaved had been born here. Those who were not had been purchased, probably when quite young, from local ship captains trading in the Caribbean islands or engaged in the African slave trade. Brought ashore to one of Kittery's scattered small settlements, the enslaved were trained to an owner's needs and often taught English and occasionally writing and arithmetic. No doubt, quite a few men learned the trade or craft of their owners, uh, carpentry, tanning, shoemaking, weaving, blacksmithing, shipbuilding, and so forth. Some arriving adult men were specifically purchased because they already had such skills or had learned English while being held captive somewhere else. Doubtless that was also true for adult women purchased for their skill at basket making, weaving, cooking, knowledge of medicinal herbs, and so forth. What I haven't mentioned in all this is that proverbial elephant in the room that profound and even more disheartening difference between early blacks and everyone else. We simply do not know who they were. Their real names, their natural human connections to their past, nor is it possible to ever find out. And all of this is a result of slave owners' racist attitude and behavior. Unlike most slave owners in the South, New Englanders imposed a deliberate process of de-Africanization upon their slaves, discarding of African names, assigning meaningless one-word names, discouraging African culture, traditions, and religion, and insisting that slaves adopt Puritan ways and religion. That process reduced a whole population to non-persons, and its damage still reverberates to this day. For one example, for modern-day descendants uh, of New England's enslaved, they inevitably encounter an impenetrable wall in trying to trace their ancestors back to Africa because of that slave naming practice. Nevertheless, it is possible to get to know more about early blacks in our community, even begin to relate a few of their personal stories. The insert in your bulletin shows the many persons that have been found so far. On a Sabbath day morning here in mid-18th century, we can now see black Richard and his wife Dinah and their two young children, Richard Jr. and Zilpha, coming up the road here from excuse me, from their small house near Fort William, that's today's Fort McClary. As far as we know, Richard was the first black to be baptized and own the covenant in this church in 1728. And he was the rarest of rarities for local blacks, a property owner. He purchased property from Pepperell, William Pepperell. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't know exactly when. It is assumed that Richard was free in, by seven, certainly when he came here, but his wife and his children's status is unknown. According to Massachusetts law, free or slave status of children followed that of the mother, not the father. 
He might leave, but she had to stay. Continuing with those churchgoers' progress that morning, we might also see Libby and her cho seven children coming along the road behind their owner, Timothy Garish, up the same road. And over on the lane bus side Lady Pepperell's house, enslaved William would likely be following his owner, Robert Follett. We'd probably see that lady's longtime servants for life, Phyllis and Sicero, as they walked up from their little cottage on what's now Lawrence Lane. And they might then fall in step with various other blacks, following Pepperell's son-in-law, Nathaniel Sparhawk, as they all came into the church. At some point, we would encounter Sambo, perhaps standing near his owner at the church door, the Reverend Benjamin Stevens. And of course, we'd see Henry Miles, a mulatto, and his wife, Bridget. Henry was the church caretaker, or sextant, here from 1728 until he died somewhere around 1757. He was hired to ring the bell, to sweep the sanctuary, and as the records say, chase out stray dogs, look after the cemetery, and carry in the christening basin when needed. His wife, Bridget, a free Negro woman, a status most unusual for her time, would be waiting for him up in one of these galleries. If you had an hour or two, uh, let's call it all day, um, I would be happy to continue painting that scene, telling you more of what I've learned over the, these last couple of years. It's really amazing how much even those small snippets of stray bits of old documents, what they can tell us and bring us closer to forgotten church members. Yes, I know. For some of you, that question hangs in the air. Why do we need to bring all this to light? It's so painful, so uncomfortable. But that discomfort is the key to the answer. I and a lot of far more knowledgeable people believe that to combat slavery's dreadful legacy of racism, we, both black and white, should face it square on, learn of its many dimensions in this country, its history, as well as recognize its impact on our nation's development from the very beginning, both here in New England as well as in the South. Gaining such understanding brings us all closer together, leads to greater recognition of our one human family and its connectedness. And with God's help, we must keep on seeking ways to strengthen that connection for ourselves and for our future generations. In honor of the people who sat up there, maybe in a back bench, I'd like to read some of their names. Among the enslaved, there's Bess. Bess and her child. Bess, Boston, another Boston, another Boston. Caesar, Caesar, Cato, Cato, Celinda, Sicero, Chloe, Cuff, Diana, Dinah, Dick and his child, Dinah, Dinah, Fanny, George, Greg, Harry, Jack, Juba, one of the few who was able to retain her African-derived name. And then there's Kittery and Libby, Lydia, Marjorie, Molly, Ned, Peter, Phyllis, 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 Pompey, Pompey, Primus, Prince, Quam, Rachel, Rebecca, Richard, Sambo, Sambo, Scipio, Titus, Toby, Will, William, and Zilpha. And the following persons appear in records simply by a designation as a black, a mulatto, uh, a wench, a Negro wench, a boy, a girl.
No name girl and boy. No name infant. No name man. No name person. No name two persons. No name person. No name six children. No name girl and boy. No name girl. No name woman. No name woman. No name man, woman, and child. No name woman, boy, and girl. No name girl. No name girl. No name girl. And these persons were likely enslaved. Uh, there was the woman Bilhah, Cato, Cyrus, and Leroy. And among the few that we believe were free or know that are free, there was Bridget and Henry Miles and their children, James and Hannah, Thomas Hercules, Richard Black. And the persons whose status is unknown, Dinah Black, Mrs. Richard, and her children, Titus and Sylvia, Mary Hercules, that's Mrs. Thomas, and Black Caesar, and Dinah. <laughs> 